Perry. It's my great honor, uh, 18 years to celebrate uh, what you've done for the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Uh, I've been given the topic of uh, cosmetic surgery. Uh, I know this has been near and dear and has occupied a, a bit of your tenure uh, <laughs> as executive director. A lot uh, of my life. In that uh, it is a part of our specialty, but from the public's perspective of who a plastic surgeon is, uh, ABPS has really represented plastic surgery very, very well uh, in relation to all the other medical specialties. So there's always been seem seemingly a controversy of who is best to do aesthetic surgery, who is the best aesthetic surgeon, and the public equates aesthetic surgery and plastic surgery to a large degree. Uh, so as long as I've been a part of the board, I've seen this controversy percolate continuously. And I know it started in the 90s when Henry Neal was, uh, was chair and uh, otolaryngology. So why don't you give us your perspective on how it was when you first took over as executive director and when where I we first are. Took <coughs> well, before I first took over and when especially was formed, that was percolating way back then in New York and other places. And uh, uh, everyone wanted to do aesthetic surgery, but they didn't want people to know they were doing it. And that was, <coughs> at any rate, <clears throat> what happened with the board certification issue was that in the early eight, in the 1960s, a, a group of otolaryngologists wanted to form an organization that would specialize in facial plastic surgery. <clears throat> so they formed an organization called the American Academy of Facial Plastic Reconstructive Surgery and subsequently formed a board, the American Board of Facial Plastic Reconstructive Surgery, which, de which developed and continued. And finally, this group wanted to get recognition by the American Board of Medical Specialties, which is the oversight premier organization for all the specialty boards. So they went in the uh, 80s to the American Board of Medical Specialties to ask them for a certificate of added qualification on their otolaryngology board certificate. This would be in addition to their otolaryngology certificate. They wanted a certificate of added qualification, what we call CAQ, in facial plastic surgery. So that appeared at the ABMS, and that appeared uh, about the time I was a director of the board. And that was before I became executive director. There was a three-year hiatus when I finished as a director in 94 until I came back in 97 as, as the first executive director. During that time, this became a very <clears throat> big issue at the ABMS because the, the otolaryngology board definitely wanted this facial plastic surgery sub-certificate CAQ. But it was, we were fighting against it at the ABMS, our board. We had support from other boards such as surgery and uh, and uh, uh, we, we garnered support to keep voting against ENT getting this because the argument was that it invaded the corpus of the specialty. In other words, otolaryngology was training people in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery to a certain degree, and plastic surgery was also, so why was there a need for a, another Sub-certificate. That was the argument, and we prevailed on that. But it became such a uh, <clears throat> became such a big issue at the ABMS with two small boards fighting against each other that they decided that you guys have got to come to some conclusion about this. And so uh, we came to a an agreement that it would be the combined uh, sub-certificate CAQ in plastic surgery within the head and neck. We eliminated the, the facial plastic surgery because there's no way we were going to come to an agreement on that. So we came to plastic surgery within the head and neck and called it and wanted to encompass all of the head and neck stuff. Then the, um, the, our specialty was not happy about that. Why was that? Because our specialty thought the board sold them out by giving in at all to ENT. And, and when you mean our specialty, are you talking about the organizational plastic surgery no, or the members about, of our diplomats? About, I thought, I'm talking about both. 
the diplomats doesn't the diplomats really didn't understand what was going on to any any large degree, but organized plastic surgery was against any cooperation at all with ENT. And how did that play at ABMS? That didn't play well at ABMS. ABMS wanted to have a combined uh, examination. They wanted us to be together on this because other specialties were doing it uh, in other subspecialty interests and they got the boards together to do it. So they didn't want this split going on because it was not playing well. So we so we had to come to some sort of compromise. It was either that or ABMS was going to give those guys facial plastic surgery. So we had to come to some compromise and that's what we that's the compromise we came to. But that did not fly well with our organizations. Didn't fly well with uh, ASPRS, didn't fly well with the Aesthetic Society. And uh, so two things happened there which I thought were were difficult for me because I was just coming on to this job, okay, <laughs> and I had this. And I, here it is. I had this crisis. So I had a crisis with two with two organizations. I go to ASPRS, and they say uh, we've appointed a committee, which is called the American Board of Plastic Surgery Oversight Committee, and we'd like you to come to our committee meetings, and we'll tell you how we're going to be oversight of the board. I said, well. I just have to tell you, this is my last meeting of this committee <laughs> because, because the board doesn't have an oversight. The board has sponsoring organizations. You nominate people from your, that you want to to the board. You're a sponsoring organization just like 20 other organizations, and you can nominate somebody to the board. Well, that was how we handled that. And at the same time, the Aesthetic Society... They were upset because of the compromise. I remember them. I was on both boards at the time. Yeah, I guess. And they were they were both organizations. Oh, I know. There I was. Very fiery so, on this issue. So the so the aesthetic society <clears throat> decided that they would. They were so upset about it. They formed their own board. So the American board of aesthetic. Well, they didn't form it. They well, really talked about it. They talked about it and they wrote questions. The questions were being written. They were being written. So I hear about the, the development of this, of the uh, uh, Aesthetic Society Board. And uh, so I call my friend Gene Curtis in Boston, who was past chair of the American Board of Plastic Surgery, and I knew Gene very well. I said, Gene, what's going on? He said, the train has left the station. You're never going to stop it. I said, well, let's see about that. So so, so that, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was the crisis time, right. 97, 98. But I remember a backlash from the members trying to form a quasi-plastic surgery board that would mimic the facial plastic board. Yeah, that was out there, too. That was out there, too, from the membership. From the membership. From the grassroots. Right. Yes. That so how did, we solve, how did you solve all this at ABMS? Because this certificate, never, or CAQ, never really came to be. Well, there are two issues. I mean, you've got to talk about ABMS, and you've got to talk about ABPS. You've got to right. talk about the board. How did we solve this at the board? Because we had a definite image problem throughout the specialty because of subspecialization and the concern that subspecialization was going to fragment the specialty. That was one issue. Then at ABMS, we had this certificate already approved and no fellowships. So what happened there was it, it was then up to the RRC through the ACGME to develop program requirements for fellowships so that the fellowships could be developed. So our plastic surgery RRC worked on this. The ENT RRC worked on it and then abandoned it, so they never came up with Why? it. Why? Why did they abandon it? They just didn't want to work with us. I mean, it just became a, uh, it just, they said, well, forget it. Now it's all head and neck cancer and it's all this stuff and we do that anyway. Why do we need a fellowship for that? And that's why it went by the wayside. Now, on the plastic surgery side, and that, so technically that certificate exists as inactive at the ABMS on both boards. Now, they call it inactive. I mean, if it were ever resurrected, we could resurrect it. But then we had our own internal, that, that was intra, that was intra specialty stuff. I'm sorry, that was inter specialty um, uh, relations. Intra specialty. We had now a 
group of people in the community that wanted to come up with a certifying board. And we had the Aesthetic Society that was starting to write questions for what could be a, a certifying board. So we had a retreat in 1999, and uh, I think this solved the problem. At least, the, at least it has up to date, up to now. And uh, <clears throat> the retreat was basically how do we recognize subspecialization and keep it within the core of the specialty. So this was the start of the advisory. Council. That was the start of the advisory. Council. So, so out of chaos actually became a very nice system. Absolutely. To, so I, you know, if if I had to think of any one thing that I personally have done in this whole eight, last 18 years it, that has benefited the board most it was the, and the specialty most, it's been the advisory councils. Have you talked about the advisory councils? And other, have other? not, not in any well, why, other way. Why don't way. you briefly talk, yeah, uh, talk how that has changed the board? Oh yeah, it's, it's been great. The, the, um, the concept was we had this three-day retreat in the middle of the summer in 1999, which was awful. And we invited Wally Ritchie, who was my counterpart at surgery, who was having a real difficult time with the vascular surgeons. Vascular surgeons wanted to split off and form their own board. And uh, thoracic surgery already had their own board, colorectal surgery had their own board, vascular wanted their own board. So when I said, Wally, and I talked with Wally all the time. He was really my mentor in the certification world. And I said, what do you think? And he said, well, I'll come over and talk to your board. So he came over and he said, you know, we're thinking about having our vascular surgeons become advisory people to the board, giving them a separate designation. Not certification, but that's hey, a great idea. So we, we, hashed out, we hashed out this advisory council concept whereby we would engage all the major subspecialty organizations in the board and then give them a function and let them, let them actually become part of the process. So we developed four of them. One was comprehensive, one was aesthetic, one was cranial maxillofacial, and the other was hand surgery. And so we got the representatives to the advisory councils from the different organizations that they came from. So the American Society of Surgery at Hand, American Association of Hand Surgery sent people to the advisory council, ASPRS, ASAPS, uh, American Society and the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery sent representatives and then the Maxillofacial Society and then eventually the Craniofacial Society. So we involved all these people as advisory councils. What were we going to do with them? Well, right at that point, I mean, that was a, that was a political solution to a political problem. But a practical solution to a practical problem was that maintenance of certification came exactly at that time. And that was coming in 2000. ABMS, this is 99 when we developed the advisory councils. ABMS made, introduced MOC, and I knew all about that because I was on the executive committee at ABMS. And, and Steve Miller was the president, and he's the past director, past chair of our board, and Carolyn Kerrigan was on the ad hoc committee. It was, it was a perfect time for us to take our new recertification program and model it. So we use the advisory council members to write the questions for the recertification exam to help us define what we, what, what, uh, what it would take in practice in order to qualify to take a specific module in the recertification exam. And then eventually, as you well know, because you were then chair of the MOC committee, um, uh, subsequently to develop the practice assessment modules and to and to write the evidence-based practice, uh, evidence-based articles to, to study from. And so the advisory councils were very, very important. So, so just, just to, in that. Uh, to distill this then out of this chaos and controversy where the ABPS was basically an isolated organization, through embracing subspecialization, you came up with the advisory councils so that the organizations could have input Correct. Directly into ABPS. Correct. It also was a way to start talent coming in that would eventually be directors. I know I was part of the first uh, aesthetic sure, advice. You I don't sure know about, were. I don't know about <laughs> talent there, but 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 uh, it was my first interaction with the board. Oh, I had been an examiner, but all of a sudden it's a different level when you're well, on the advisory council. It's definitely a different level, and, and you know we we don't like to call it farm system 
that's not the right word, but no. But in Major League Baseball, that's what it is. I mean, you you, you have you're developing, you're developing your future directors of the board through the whole process. And if somebody really isn't interested in writing questions, they, a lot of people aren't. A lot of people don't want right. to do it. So, 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 so they, it's lemonade so out of it lemons. It eliminates people. It, it shows yes. what the how the board operates and and what have you. It's not for everybody, but for those that are interested and those that want to continue on, it's a great way to do things. Okay, so let's go back to aesthetic surgery. So this this crisis kind of went away in the '90s and the and the, and the and the and the turn of the millennium. Tell us about the next 14 years. How? Okay. how Because I know it's resurfaced with right. ocular plastics, oculofacial plastics. So. There are two things going on right now of, in, in aesthetic surgery. One of them is the resurrection of the American Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery back to fellowships. Okay, they ignored the fellowships back in the late 90s. Now they come back to the ACGME for a fellowship in facial plastic surgery. That's what they want. So they come back to the ACGME. The ACGME said, well, we have to see how this impacts other specialties. So they came back and talked to us at Plastic Surgery. And uh, we quickly talked with our constituency and said, maybe this is the time to elevate aesthetic training for our graduates who want to take an aesthetic fellowship, maybe they would like to take an accredited facial aesthetic fellowship with the facial plastic surgery group. So we studied this and talked with our RRC and Rod Rorick, uh, who is an aesthetic surgeon, as you know, in Dallas is was chair of the RRC. And he and I and the surgery director, uh, John Potts at the ACGME, the chair of the, board, the, chair of the uh, RRC from otolaryngology and the executive director from otolaryngology, we had a one half day meeting at Dulles Airport in August of 2013 and came up with this, a, a potential solution that plastic surgery would join with ENT and facial plastic surgery fellowships. Fellowships. ACGME accredited. ACGME accredited, ACGME accredited fellowships. So the, the board would never get to doing a sub-certificate unless they pe people went through the ACGME fellowships. Well, this was, <clears throat> this was uh, revolutionary because in that, in a couple of decades, our specialty came around to saying, well, maybe we should work with them. Maybe it would be beneficial. Maybe our residents are not getting enough rhinoplasty exposure. Maybe we, maybe we should do this and see what we can do. So how did this play with the organizational plastic surgery where you had the initial um, pushback the, la the, the last time? There in was the a 90s. little bit of a pushback, not much, but I, I remember going to the Aesthetic Society Board for the ABPS report in New York, when, when the Aesthetic Society was in New York most recently, and, um, and reported that this was in the works. And uh, it got mixed reviews at the board level. I thought there was, there was some support that was, that was there. And then gradually, I think a lot through the uh, intelligence, uh, persuasiveness, and real experience of Dr. Rorick, who was in a perfect position <coughs> That this that that it that it became more of a reality, but then what's happened is that when the American Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery found out that the ACGME was going to allow us to be co-fellowship people, plastic surgery and e and and uh, and otolaryngology, they demanded that their application be withdrawn. What, what, what was the reason for that? The reason for that was, first of all, they didn't want to work with plastic surgery. At least that was on the surface, but that's probably not the real reason. Secondly, they thought about this whole process a little bit, and they said, you know, ACGM accreditation is really onerous. What we have in our fellowships right now is we have a preceptorship. Guy comes to work with me in the office, helps me in the office. We do some reconstructive cases, we bill for them, 
we help pay his salary, all that sort of stuff. That can't happen in an ECGME educational program. So they have, so they ha and they would have to follow the rules. And it would have to be institutionally based instead of office based. It would have to follow the institutional rules of the ACGME and the office rules and, and, and the uh, uh, program requirements. So they didn't like that. Thirdly, I think they were very concerned that if we were involved in this whole thing, we already have sitting at the ABMS a sub-certificate approval in plastic surgery within the head and neck. That would just have to be changed to facial plastic surgery. That would be a paper change. And they have this board of facial plastic surgery that's been in existence for a number of decades. It's, but it's not an ABMS board. It's not an ABMS board. That's exactly right, Jim. It's a, it's a self-designated board, which is not an ABMS board. And that's been, in, that's been in place. And I think that they were concerned that if the fellowships were accredited, if both specialties did it, Certainly, they wouldn't be giving the exams, and they wouldn't be doing the certification. So the, I think they came, they came to a eureka moment, you know, where they said, hey, what are we doing? So they wrote to Dr. Nasca, who's the president of, uh, of uh, ACGME, and demanded, demanded that their application be withdrawn. Interesting. Now, and what about the oculoplastics? Where is well, that? Well, I get to that, but let me, let, me figure, let me finish this story. This had already gone through the ACGB board with approval. Huh. Okay? Dr. Na Nobody demands things of Dr. Nasco. I, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> and so he, he said, sorry, our board, our, our board has already approved this. This is going ahead. So, so that they're out there worried. Oculoplastic is another issue, which is a good one. Ocu they the uh, oculo America, the oculo facial plastic surgery society academy want wanted to have a sub certificate in oculo facial surgery. And they went to the facial surgery. And they went to the ACMG immediately. They went to the ACG immediately to get this approved. Uh, the American Board of Ophthalmology has not liked. Uh, subspecialty uh, fragmentation. They didn't. They don't want fragmentation. They don't have any sub certificates. We have one in hand surgery. They don't have any. They don't have one in retina. They don't have one in cornea. And they don't want to do it because it just is something they don't want to fragment. So they weren't happy about this. The board wasn't happy about this oculofacial thing. And of course, our specialty was not happy about oculofacial. So we protested at the ACGME, and the, our board wrote a letter, you know, in public comment, objecting to this, 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 and this. And so it was changed to oculoplastic, and they took the word facial out. And then it came back again, and they had all these different requirements that everybody objected to, and went back and revised. Now we're in about the fifth revision of this, and it hadn't changed much. So we're... We, we have until December 14th to once again go back to the ACGME and tell them what we don't like about their requirements, which are uh, peri the, the real issue is periorbital, which means anything around the orbit. Now, if you start drawing concentric circles around the orbit, you, you're encompassing a lot. We want it to be periocular, just around the eye, in the orbit, within the orbit. Their program requirements have, are unbelievable. They have rhididectomy. They've got reconstruction of tumors in the periorbital area, which could be forehead, cheek, chin, whatever. They've got turbinectomy, sinus surgery, uh, uh, and all this stuff is in there. So it's obvious that they want to move, out, oculoplastic wants to move out of, the, uh, out of that world. So they're back at the ACGME again for another another round and we're going to go through another round of taking their application apart and showing why we don't think that should be there and this should be there. Now, well, I, don't know where, I don't know where it's going to end up. Well, well, it's interesting to see though that there's been a gradual change in terms of the recognition of the validity of aesthetic surgery, the importance of aesthetic surgery. I know the RRC now has increased the requirements in training programs. Right. And, and so, so what this is a big issue for the specialty in general. Not necessarily the academic part of the specialty, but, but the, for the members at large and the public's recognition as to who is a plastic surgeon. So what's your, what is your 
advice? What do you see in the future? What should we be doing to, to keep our core here in aesthetic surgery? I think we need to, I think we need to improve, if we can, uh, our exposure to aesthetic surgery in the residency programs. <clears throat> that, uh, uh, the RRC has increased its case requirements, right. and they've, they've, they've done a good job at that. But we have, um, we have a need in the residency programs to get good exposure to aesthetic surgery. And Do you think your program chairman are embracing that? You no, think there's been a I don't think they are. I, I think that I think that what what it's my opinion. I, I don't know whether it's uh, it, it's universally held, but I think a lot of our academic program directors are are uh, having difficulties with teaching aesthetic surgery for a lot of reasons. One is the hospitals want reconstructive cases and they and so they put pressure on the plastic surgery program directors to build up free to build up uh, you know patients that are going to be hospitalized so they can get reimbursed it's, uh, there's a whole economic issue here and it's, aesthetic cases are largely outpatient <coughs> and are not are not much within the hospital system that's one issue and secondly um, it's you are a tremendous exception to the rule but a lot of faculty people are not willing to really get involved in education of aesthetic residents. I know that in our program, um, we have, we are, we are, we are definitely making an effort to do it. But we've lost some aesthetic people. Uh, Linton Whitaker retired. Don Larosa died. I mean, we, you know, it, it's ha it's happening. And are we bringing up? And I'm I'm there, and Dr. Bucky's there. But we start bringing up people from. Are we really fertilizing that group? So I think we really need to have a a focus at the residency level. I'm probably talking about this too much, but but that has to happen. And then the next issue is how do we take them past residency if we're going to do things? And should we have better aesthetic fellowships? I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how many of our graduates really want to take aesthetic fellowships if they were available. Probably they would, because it's a very important part of the specialty. When you look at our maintenance and certification programs and our exams, more people take the exam in the aesthetic module than in any other module. And these are people that are out in practice 10 years. So, well, but I, I can tell you, because I get a lot of visitors from around the country, and, I, and there's a great variability in terms of their exposure, at least to facial aesthetic surgery, from institution to institution. Oh, yeah. But there's much less variability in, say, exposure to lower extremity trauma right. or even to hand surgery. Right. So how, how does the... Or even, or even if you stay on the aesthetic thing, there's less variability below the clavicle. That's cool. You know, the... the Less variability in abdominoplasty. Uh, and you have less other specialties competing for that as well. Correct. So, so it really comes down to a facial aesthetic surgery. It does. How, how do you get the, and this really is not an ABPS issue, uh, uh, American Board of Plastic Surgery issue so much as it is for residency training. Yeah. But there is a, but a lot of your program directors are part of our, our, our board here. And how, so how do we get them to embrace this concept that it's important for the specialty? Or, or do you think that's important? There's no question it's important for the specialty. When I think, you know, when I look at the number of rhinoplasties I did as a resident compared to the number of rhinoplasties that our chief resident is doing, it's amazing. I mean, we did a lot of rhinoplasties back in the day. In the day. I did too. Yeah, I know you did. So I, so I think that, it, and it's the same program though. This is the same program. So we've got to figure this out somehow. Is it marketing? Maybe. Is it is it institutional marriages of uh, facial plastic surgery and plastic surgery, and, and which would which could then lead to fellowships? And don't, don't forget dermatology here, because we become such a non-surgical aesthetic. Correct. Embrace and dermatology. Well, and dermatology. And dermatology, right. So, so it's, it's an interesting um, problem. And, it and, is. And, but ABB, ABMS wants to kind of stay out of this. I, I tell oh, right you. now they've got it solved. <coughs> ABMS has it solved. We, are, we have a sub-certificate. It's sitting there. It's inactive. 
bring 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 back the fellows to take the exams, and then we'll write the exams. So it's not right. really an ABMS issue. Thanks. It's a it's a grassroots issue in the whole country and maybe the world. And it's a grassroots issue there about who's doing it and who should be trained to do it and how can we train them to do it. And my feeling is that that cooperation is the way to go, especially in the facial stuff. Well, you know, Barry, it's been a great summary regarding aesthetic surgery, but I keep coming back to the same point in that when, when the public thinks of who is a plastic surgeon, th this is a core issue. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, I think ABPS has to be leading the way on this issue uh, for the future of our specialty. What would you suggest we do? You've been chair of the board. You've been chair of the MOC committee. What I think, would, I think how, how would you, how would you, how I, would, as an advisor to ABPS, what would you say? I think you need a, a, a uh, institutional change among program directors to embrace the need for this. Because I think monetarily that this could happen. It would have to happen out of the hospital system in, in setting up ancillary clinics where right. people, uh, and they would incorporate it into their residency, but more importantly, they would incorporate it institutionally into starting fellowships. Right. I think that would be the way to do it, and I think it could be financially viable, but I think program directors, I still sense that some program directors embrace the need for this, and I think that some really don't necessarily think it's so important as part of residency training. So I agree. So, so I, agree until, I agree with that, but what, how does the board do it? I mean, that's what I've been saying, but how does the board do it? The board is pretty <laughs> influential in changing thought. Yeah, so uh, and and the and the board is the one congregation. Yes, there's the ACAPS, and but the board is the congregation of the program directors under one umbrella, meeting twice a year. And and I think the board is is quite influential in changing thought. So, and it's to me the board has always been the unifying organization with all plastic surgery. No question about that. We okay. are a unifying organization. You are, and, and and all the organizations in plastic surgery they may bicker among one another, but they, the umbrella. Other organizations may want to be the umbrella. The umbrella is ABPS. I think so too. Well, Barry, I think so too. And thank you for your advice. I mean, I, that's, what I, that's where it's at. It's at education. It's a celebration of your great work. With the, we're here today in Phoenix, and you're the one who brought us to Phoenix in '96. And that's right. and uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the the board certification process and oral exam gets better and better. And you've just done a terrific job. My congratulations. Jim, thank you very much. Thank you for all your help during your time as chair. And my honor, my greatest honor in plastic surgery to be part of the board. Thank you. Barry, this is a pleasure to be here. I'm Tom Musto. I was on the board of directors uh, from 2006 to 2012 and I, I served as treasurer but I also had the distinct pleasure of uh, serving on the, as a representative on the board, American Board of Medical Specialties, and uh, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And I think before I came onto it, I suppose I really didn't understand <coughs> what an important organization it is for plastic surgery, and uh, Barry, I guess that's my first thing I'd like you to articulate is why, what is the importance of ABMS to American Board of Plastic Surgery. Well, it's important to all the certifying boards because it's the parent organization that uh, uh, there are 24 certifying boards in medicine, ranging from pediatrics to plastic surgery. And, and uh, the American Board of Medical Specialties helps us set the standards for certification with, it, with the goal of improving the quality of medical care by certification. So why is it important to plastic surgery? Well, plastic surgery is a specialty that has um, broad overlap. Uh, we, we do, some people say the skin and its contents, <laughs> but so we do a lot of surgery which interfaces with other specialties. And sometimes we develop techniques that other specialties use in their, in their procedures such as uh, reconstruction of the head and neck that the otolaryngologists will use in their, in their surgery. So it's, so it's good for us to have an interface with, with all the other specialties in medicine for that reason. The birth defects, it's, not, it's good to have com, uh, coordination and conversations with pediatrics. And uh, it's, it just it, it works that way at, at one level. 
Another level is that uh, it recognizes the American Board of Plastic Surgery as the certifying board, which is distinct from other self-proclaimed or self-designated certifying boards in areas that we do. And th there are many of those. <clears throat> yeah, I, I was, I, I would certainly, from my experience, uh, would strongly agree with that. I, um, one of the things that to me uh, is, is interesting is that the ABMS has a group of executive directors and I think they're incredibly important um, for a variety of reasons, uh, continuity, uh, institutional history, and maybe you could elaborate on, on why you think an executive director is important for our board. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question, Tom, because <clears throat> when I became, when I took over this, this position in 1997, we really did not have a good presence at the ABMS. We were, we were uh, all the other boards had executive directors that were going to the ABMS meetings, and we were not there. We were not at the table. You know what they say, if you're not at the table, you might be on the menu. So <laughs> I thought that was... <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't heard that, but that's, that's, that's how that's, true, how true. <laughs> I thought that was a good thing to... Uh, 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 we, we really, and at that time, there was a lot of conflict because the American Board of Otolaryngology, which is one of your certifying boards, yes. Uh, uh, wanted to have a sub-certificate or a certificate of quali added qualification in facial plastic surgery. And they were putting arguments forward for that. And uh, plastic surgery only had a voice uh, through our annual changing represent representative who was at the ABMS. So that, so that that was one of the stimuli for us to get an executive director. One of them, and uh, it, besides governance and administration, representation at organizations was um, was considered to be very important by the board at that time. So that's when they established the position. Well, one of the things to just to get a little more specific that came up under our term, you've mentioned uh, our interactions with the American Board of Otolaryngology more recently. Oculoplastic surgery wanted to uh, conclude within their domain uh, the eye and all all contiguous structures which uh, could yes. broadly be construed to be the face and it seems to me that again that's where well fortunately it's it's not quite at the ABMS what's happening with the oculoplastic situation is that it's at the ACGME which is the which is the residency uh, programs and the fellowship development. So we um, uh, initially, the organization of oculoplastic surgeons came up with a request for a, a, a fellowship accreditation in oculofacial surgery. Oculofacial surgery seemed like a long way from being an ophthalmologist so that was, that was uh, uh, revised after much protest to become oculoplastic surgery. And then the discussion came about, well, what, does this, what is this? And the big discussion was whether it should be periorbital around the orbit, and then how do you define periorbital? That could go anywhere to the neck and or the scalp and that's a little bit outside the scope of ophthalmologists, or periocular, which is inside the orbit. So that, that argument went on for a while, and different revisions were made, and now it's back again, as of last month. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the program requirements are once more back, and we've got until December 14th at our board to make a make a uh, revision of the uh, of the program requirements that they're doing I mean, and, it, and it includes operations such as turbinectomy sinus surgery um, 
septoplasty, rhinodectomy uh, of the of the of the mid face, um, brow, uh, etc., and reconstructive procedures in the periorbital area. And of course, you have to get the ACGME, ACGME in terms of training requirements, but you also have ABMS in terms of what can be listed on a certificate of subspecialty, correct? Correct. correct. Now, the American Board of Ophthalmology, fortunately, does not have any subcertificates. And they have resisted it because they want to keep subcertification or they want to keep the core of the specialty of ophthalmologists. And they're, they're concerned, as we were, many, as we are sometimes, where that, fragment, that subspecialization can lead to fragmentation of the core specialty. And so they, they, they feel that they, I'm not sure that the mood at the ophthalmology board is such to give them a subcertificate. I understand. Well, <clears throat> to, to change gears a little bit, one of the major focuses of the ABMS for the last few years has been really for a number of years, maintenance of certification. Um, and could you explain why ABMS or the role ABMS plays in, um, and, and how plastic surgery inter interfaces with ABMS in terms of maintenance of certification programs? Yes, well, I, no need to get into the history because in another interview, we talked about how maintenance certification came about. But right now, uh, uh, ABMS has been the catalyst to have maintenance certification happen among the boards. And, right, and at the present time, it's trying to standardize some of the requirements for maintenance certification. And ABMS has come out with a, with a program called the 2015 Standards. And by, by 2015, which is, ne they started this a couple of years ago, by 2015, which is next year, they will be um, uh, trying to unify the standards that the boards are supposed to follow to, uh, to get their MOC programs established. Do you see ABMS, if you had to envision where you think it's going to be in 10 years versus where it is now, do you think it's in an organization that is going to be increasingly relevant uh, or decreasingly relevant, or, or you're not sure? I think, it, uh, I, I think it depends on relevant to whom. <laughs> and that's the, I think it's going to, I really think it's going to be increasingly relevant. Um, I, I believe that as time goes on over the next decade or two in American medicine, that uh, the external stakeholders are going to be looking for a quality voice. Yes. And, and uh, ABMS is perfectly positioned to be the quality voice of, uh, of uh, certification and uh, hopefully competence in the, in the American physician. So that's a, that's a definite goal on the long range strategic plan of ABMS. And the other, the other, factor that ABMS is getting into very much is the international certification world. Because um, uh, American certification of American physicians, they, they really have pretty well organized. And, and there is a, a question, a, a, a perceived demand, and a lot of requests from international areas that ABMS and would be doing exams for. Yes. For example, it started with uh, uh, Singapore, and the, the Singapore was Singapore was the first program to get into this because they wanted to have uh, American residency program processes, and then and then uh, for education, and then certification exams. So Singapore is essentially done, and they've given a few of the exams already in some of the specialties. Next project is the Middle East. And the Middle East is uh, is right on the uh, right on the radar screen at the present time. The ABMS has decided that we, that we we are going to go ahead with the Middle East project, and currently 15 boards are working on that. I have hopes that plastic surgery will someday get involved, <laughs> and uh, 
and the Middle East is, is the Qatar Regional Consortium, which is Qatar, Abu Dhabi, uh, uh, Oman, and uh, the American University in Beirut. So there are opportunities that AVMS wants to do internationally. To get back to the issue of um, ABMS being the quality specialty um, or representing uh, really a, a certificate of quality if you're ABMS uh, board certified, um, obviously plastic surgery has a, there's a lot of players in the space of aesthetic surgery. How do you see, uh, how do we interact with other specialties within ABMS? in that area, what should we be doing long term, how do we benefit from a ABMS being strong in terms of, I guess, protecting our, our expertise in that sure, space? I'm not sure I can answer that from the standpoint of ABMS uh, because I don't really think it's high on their radar screen right now, but I think I sh can answer from my personal opinion and my observations in the ABMS and where we're going. I, there's no question that there are specialties out there that have an interest in doing aesthetic surgery. Yes. And these specialties are based in other surgery, other surgical and non-surgical specialties. I, we, we, most of us don't consider dermatology to be a, to be a surgical specialties, but they're interested in doing aesthetic surgery. Yes. So all of these things are, are, uh, <clears throat> are issues. And then outside of the 24 certifying boards are a whole group of self-designated boards that are out there, the most prominent of which is the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery, which is a group of previously ABMS certified people who focus on cosmetic surgery and want to be certified by the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery which is outside the realm of ABMS. And the, the uh, concern is that the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery will try to gain equivalency on a state-by-state -state basis with ABMS boards. So, all right, so what do we do at ABMS? I think the best thing to do is have communication. I don't believe the plastic surgery is ever going to stop these other boards from, or these other specialties from doing aesthetic surgery. Yes. They're going to do it. And I think that we have got to, as plastic surgery, we've got to take a leadership role in this and try to become more inclusive if we can. And if we could be leaders in the aesthetic surgery world, both in fellowships and in certification examinations, I believe that the other boards will, will coalesce with us. And, I, and this is, you know, I mean, it, it, maybe it's a pipe dream, but I really think that we've got the reputation now for being uh, on the forefront of aesthetic surgery. F fully half of our, uh, uh, well, yeah, the majority of our practice assessment modules that we do in, in maintenance and certification are aesthetic procedures. So it's, so it's, a, big, it's a big chunk of the plastic surgery specialty. But one thing I, I think you will forever be known as, as a communicator, and I, uh, I, I couldn't wholeheartedly agree from what I saw that communication with other specialties rather than uh, is, is the way to go. I, I think that uh, along those lines, as you being a communicator, you were uh, maybe still are the longtime uh, head of the executive director group <laughs> Eddie BMS and uh, is that something that you uh, tell me about your experiences or whatever you want to <laughs> say but, but, but I think it's it's something that it should not be completely um, I, I, I think it's one thing that's made you effective I think it's been a, I think it, you're right I think it's been an effective thing now, here I am and plus in, in a small specialty sitting as an executive director and we had this little coalescence of executive directors and we'd have these informal meetings about about where how do you do this exam how do you do that exam and then all of a sudden the administration at abms came up with this enhanced public trust initiative which was a bit which was taking abms from what it had been to, uh, to to the rest of the world, and so as executive directors, we were sort of 
okay, well, we need to have some voice in this because we're being ignored. I mean, we were. Yes, <laughs> we were yes. basically, by the previous administration, we were, we were basically being ignored. ignored. So uh, the person who directed the caucus was, the, uh, uh, from, was from anesthesiology, and he retired. And so they, he said, well, we need to select somebody to take my place. And I was in the back of the room not paying much attention, and all of a sudden I got elected. So <laughs> that's, that's how that happened. But it was a great opportunity because we have now taken that to the, we have a regular spot on the ABMS agenda. We have tremendous uh, respect from Dr. Nora, who is the new president yes. of and CEO of ABMS, she includes the executive director group and the board of directors in all communications. In other words, she, she considers that to be sort of an equal uh, communication network. And we now have a, a position on the um, agenda of the board meetings. So the report from the executive director caucus comes right after the report of the president. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're right there and we're right there in the scene and people listen to us and communicating with all my colleagues, all of whom we all have similar but different problems and we share our problems and share our similarities and we try to improve things and that's how it works. Well, I have to say from my perspective, let's face it, when we are a small board and when you have the head of a group that is influential being a member of our board, even though you're achieving consensus and collegiality, needless to say, you're at the table, you're not on the menu, and uh, to use your phrase, and, and I, I think that's uh, very true. Now, one of the issues that's occasionally come up in the board of directors meetings, um, and I certainly, I think it was pretty successfully resolved, was, it was the concern that the board, ABMS, grew substantially and their budget grew substantially, and there were some concerns that their budget was going to, <coughs> that the boards would lose uh, their independence on autonomy. And um, so two things, do you think the American Board of Plastic Surgery gets their money's worth out of their dues from ABMS? Uh, number two, do you think there's realistic concerns that the board will lose autonomy, or do you think that that, that has been pretty effectively addressed? Right now, I, I believe we, to answer your first question, I believe we do get our money's worth out of it, although the, because of other income sources, ABMS has really not increased its dues taxation to the boards, to the individual boards. This has been a good thing. And they're very careful to say that these international projects need to be self-supporting. They're yes. not going to go to our diplomats. They're not going to get, go to you practicing in Chicago and ask for a donation to support something in the Middle East. That's not going to happen. The other thing that's going on right now is the so-called consistency project. Um, and this is what you, I think you were getting at. Yeah. How are the boards, how can the ABMS get the boards to be consistent yet maintain independence yes. in a lot of the projects? And so right now there's a, there's a, the current uh, consens consistency project is underway and at our, media, our coming board meeting in January is going to be a big topic. Uh, what, where, where, should we be, where should we be more consistent? Well, we should be consistent in ethics and professionalism and, re, and license requirements in that sort of thing. Where should we be different? Well, we should be different in oral exams yes. and, and, how, um, and how we go about our fees and our finances and what have you. So that's all understandable. But getting, getting the consistency defined is a difficult thing. I think, I think ABMS is right to do this. I think that all boards should have on their websites whether someone is participating in MOC or meeting the requirements of MOC. Yes. And you cannot even make that definition right now. So they, there's a long way to go, but I think ABMS is going to do well with that eventually. Well, I, as I said, I, I do think it's 
an important organization. You've played in, I think, a, an incredibly important role. Are there any um, additional thoughts that you would like to, 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 to sort of focus on in terms of ABMS, ABMS itself. A ABMS I think one of the best ABS. things. That, I think one of the best things in my time that ABMS has done was change its governance. Yes. It this this is an interesting project, and I must take my hat off to the American Board of Internal Medicine because they they supported this change in governance. And you have to understand how it used to be that if there was some decision to be made of importance at ABMS. It was made by the assembly, which was sort of a congress, if you will. Right. So, it, and and in the house of or the house of representatives, which which meant you had representation and voting according to the size of the board. So, anything that you wanted to get done that was of importance had to have the support of internal medicine, pediatrics, family practice. You didn't have that support. There's no sense in even trying to do it. Yeah. So what happened was that that governance structure changed. It used to be an executive committee on which I sat, which was fortunate, and the, and the assembly. Now we have a board of directors, which, uh, which has one member from every board sitting around the table. Internal medicine supported that. They thought it was good for medicine to have this happen. And, uh, and in fact, it has been. Now the assembly has gone away. It's been it's been um, uh, sunset or disbanded or whatever the word is, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and now it's now the organization runs. I think the governance change, aside from MOC, which has been a big project, I think the governance change has been a has been a very positive thing. Well, I I, I agree. I witnessed some of that, and uh, um, I think with those words, I I just again would restate that. The American Board of Medical Specialties, I strongly feel, will be more relevant with time. I think that it's incredibly important that plastic surgery be well represented. And I have to say, Barry, in my opinion, one of the real, his real legacies is the respect that plastic surgery has in ABMS and, and, and really, I think, has an outsized influence to the size of its board. But I'm sure he won't disagree. But, well, uh, I, I thank you for the kind <laughs> words, Tom. But I, it's, they're heartfelt. I, I thank you very much. I know that I know they uh, you as a rep, as one of our representatives through the ABMS uh, at the time on the board of directors of ABMS. Coming from you, that's a good thing because yeah. uh, you know that, that 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 means a lot to me. Thanks very much, Perry. Thank you, Tom. Dr. Noon, congratulations again on your 18 years of working with the board. You have such a vast amount of knowledge. I hope you don't mind if we dig into it and uh, get some of your thoughts about the future of the board going forward. Right. So it's my understanding that the number of diplomates who are now participating in MOC has surpassed the number of those without time-limited certificates. So how do you see that changing the function of the board? board is going to function uh, in a little bit different way because we're not going to have one of the biggest complaints that come in from the diplomates uh, regarding how, why must I participate in MOC, in MOC when the guy across the street does not have to. So I think in, way, in many ways it's going to make it easier for the board from the standpoint of public relations. Uh, in, in, Tra specialty relations, and I think it's going to make it better for us with inter-specialty relations because, yeah. because as we as we uh, go forward and everyone is participating in MOC, uh, we're going to it'll be it'll be a standard across medicine. Okay. So this is a good thing, and it's, right. going to, it's going to make our job. It's going to make your job easier, <laughs> Dr. Brandt, when you become when you sit in this side of the chair. <laughs> And, it, and uh, it'll it'll be uh, it'll be a little bit easier. So we, well, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Correct. Just easier, without the grandfathers, because that's the, that's that's of the top five complaints we get all the time. It's because it's it's the grandfather issue. Yeah. How come they don't have to do it, and I have to? 
Well, professional development uh, begins in medical school, continues through residency, and then on into your career and all the way to retirement. So do you ever foresee a uh, function of the board in residency or even in medical school? Uh, yeah, I think that the board, <clears throat> the board has a role. The, the primary purpose of the board is to serve the public and to make sure that people, as best we can, that those we're training are taking good care of the patient by staying current, by doing the proper thing as best they can. And I think that the board sets the standards for that. And that standard to get to that educational level should start in medical school. I think, I think that the, the medical school uh, process, uh, plastic surgery needs to be exposed in medical school to the, to the, to the medical students who will then, whether they become plastic surgeons or not, will appreciate what the specialty does yes. and will know what, what, special, what, what plastic surgery is all about. And then it uh, obviously in the res after graduation from medical school and the residency programs, the, uh, uh, the standards need to be, need to be established so that, the, so that those that are being trained are going to uphold the standards when they finish. Absolutely. So the state, uh, the Federation of State Medical Boards has recognized that licensure needs to incorporate some elements of continuous educational development and knowledge assessment. The ABMS boards, of course, with their MLC program, are way ahead in this. Do you ever envision a time when maintenance of certification will supplant licensure? Not in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> It's a problem maybe for not, the next guy. And maybe huh? not in your lifetime. <laughs> uh, maintenance, of license, uh, maintenance of licensure is a concept that the Federation of State Medical Boards, the FSMB, which is a great concept. Yeah. The problem is the implementation of the concept. Because when you think of the FSMB, it's a federation of licensing boards. So the licensing boards are traditionally in the states. And the licensing boards are controlled by a number of different ways. Yeah. Either they're elected to the board or they're appointed by the governor, There's a, depending on the state. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's a whole political situation that's out there. And they want to keep license as the minimum standard. In other words, to practice yeah. medicine uh, in Pennsylvania... You, it's, it's a minimum standard. You need to pass an examination, which is a state examination. Um, perhaps board certification may, may, be, may substitute for that examination in the future. It would be nice. It would be a good idea. Uh, then you have to demonstrate that you're continually educating yourself by collecting what we call CMEs. So that, that's a minimum standard. Will... MOC ever supplant MOL? Um, uh, I think in certain parts of MOC it will. For example, um, CME that's, that's required for MOC in part two uh, is being accepted by a number of states as satisfying their, their mm -hmm. CME requirements. So already there's some headway. Uh, would it ever get to the point where there'd be such uniform standards of state requirements that they would say okay if you are perform if you're uh, up to date with MOC in your specialty that takes care of your license renewal it's a renewal of the licenses the trend is there well when will it ever happen it's like the states <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it's a, it's a federal state issue <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a federal That's government right. state government issue so, you know, in the late uh, 80s, there was a push by the facial plastic surgeons and ENT to gain a certificate in plastic surgery. That was sort of detoured into a certificate of plastic surgery in the head and neck. Well, they're trying again by establishing a fellowship in cosmetic surgery. How do you see the role of ABPS in that? Well, first of all, the <clears throat> we, we need to be, we have been at the table. ABPS has been at the table because we learned in the 80s that we weren't really at the table. 
And what happened was the the American Bo the American Board of Otolaryngology in the 80s uh, put through the request for a certificate. As, well, in those days, at the ABMS was called Certificate of Added Qualification, CAQ in facial plastic surgery, and uh, that was objected to by plastic surgery, uh, otolaryngology. I'm sorry. Uh, general surgery, ophthalmology, other, mm -hmm. other specialties. And so they did not get that certificate. The compromise was that there would be a certificate in plastic surgery within a head and neck, which would encompass a lot of head and neck topics, from congenital to trauma right. to tumor. And so we, um, uh, uh, that was at the ABMS, which is a certification area. What they hadn't done was done the accreditation first so fellowships should in my mind precede certification yep. <laughs> training should come before the exam. <laughs> that's it, correct it, it's, a, it's a basic principle yeah. and and, and uh, so they said okay we need to develop the fellowships and they never did uh, uh, plastic surgery RRC came up with program requirements the ENT RRC ignored it and it never happened so years later now we're uh, we're we're back, what is 20, 20 years, over 20 years later, 25 years later, yeah. they're coming up with, uh, uh, with a fellowship request, the same group, American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive yeah. Surgery, is coming back with a fellowship request, and our specialty, instead of resisting it, made the decision that we should join it at the fellowship mm -hmm. level. And that's where we are yeah. at, at this point and um, uh, trying to develop a joint fellowship in facial plastic surgery, which would then someday perhaps lead to an examination by the board, but maybe not because um, uh, it, it, it depends on the structure of the American Board of Otolaryngology. I believe that the American Board of Plastic Surgery would follow the process right. and would do the exam in facial plastic surgery. What's happening is the facial plastic surgery group has a board called the Correct. American Board of Facial Plastic Surgery. They are not part, they are, they are a separate board from the American Board of Otolaryngology, which is ABMS recognized. So they would not get a sub-certificate from ABMS. That complicates the issue. Right. So when will the board, when will our board get involved? We'd have to, we'd have to we have to wait for the for the for the fellowships to be developed. We have to wait for the um, uh, examinations to be decided upon. Um, maybe not in your lifetime. Yeah, maybe, maybe more than <laughs> nine maybe years. Maybe <laughs> that could be another one that might, yeah, that might be. Yeah, tuck a bullet later. there. Uh, so arguably, the United States has. Uh, the best training in medicine and certifying physicians. Developing countries are starting to reach out for our expertise. In addition to the annual oral exams in November, do you envision an annual trip overseas for our board to examine foreign trainees? It was interesting that uh, Dr. Bentz, who was chair of the oral exam, just finished this interview, uh, and, he, and, and he said, what do you think about the future? Well, I think that you're speaking only of oral exams now, uh, traveling to examine somebody right. orally, because we certainly can do written exams electronically, and, right. and uh, that's, that's easy. I mean, it's not easy, but, it, but it's certainly doable. The only thing that would need to be done is, is a translation Correct. In, into, yeah. the, into, the, into the language of the country. The oral exam, I think, would be, would, would be a little more difficult, because we'd have to send examiners who could speak the language and yeah. you would sit in the process. I, I, I envision that process as being virtual. Oh, yeah. A virtual oral examination, technology is there. It can be done. It can, you can do it now. You could sit here and um, uh, Dr. Jones could sit in whatever country and you would feel as though you're in the same room. Yeah. And you can talk to each other. The only thing that the only thing you can't do is shake hands 
<laughs> Seriously, yeah. see the emotion Correct. on the other person's right. face, and then you and then you could. So I would say that before we ever before we make trips to do oral exams, we're probably going to do virtual exams. But where are we internationally as a, as a specialty in plastic surgery? In my view, and I think we really have to really be into this scene is right. to uh, is to the board now with this opportunity. The ACGME has established. Uh, residency programs or is using American based residency programs in Singapore that's already done and now it's now it's the Middle East and who knows what after that what our board needs to do is to push plastic surgery into these countries because they don't have a definition of what plastic surgery really is right and this I think this is this is the biggest service our board can do internationally well, we can't do it really until the ACGME says we'll put fellowships Ships in or residencies in place. Right. And I, I, I find this to be a fascinating topic at the ABMS because they are dedicated to this. Yeah. Very dedicated to it. And we've got to be in, the, I think we've got to be in the game. Right now we're not. <laughs> we've, got, we've got to push for that. Right. So you, you brought up the issue of uh, increasing technology and being able to do things virtually. So. It's our mission as a board to try to protect the public trust in our diplomates as being skillful. So can you imagine someday in the future uh, the board looking in on operations virtually in order to try and judge the skill of our diplomates? Sure. I think you could. I think, yeah. it, I think it's there. I think, I think what it is, it's a question of cost sure I mean that, that's basically yeah. the, that you can send a video team to an OR <laughs> and you can you can have a the operation going on by the you have to identify all the security issues would have HIPAA, to be dealt with all yeah. the HIPAA issues yeah. would have to be dealt with all that stuff could be dealt with but yeah I think technology is is probably the easiest part of that process. Take, <laughs> yeah, take, the, take yeah. the video and uh, take the video and uh, and then email it to the board and say, "This is Dr. Brent doing a hand up, do, doing a hand replant." How do you do? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, over time, we've gone from certification to recertification to maintenance of certification to continuous certification. What's next? In the certification world, um, continuous certification. I think what what next is the way the world is going. The government is getting so involved in everything, and the external stakeholders. Uh, there are many external stakeholders: the the, the patient himself or herself, the federal government, the state governments, the the quality assurance uh, uh, organizations. These external stakeholders are going to drive what's next. I don't think we have a big choice in that. Yeah. No, we're, we're, doing our, we're doing our continuous certification because, <laughs> we're doing our continuous certification because the, um, uh, we want to assure the public, external stakeholders in general, right. that we're doing the best we can. So where are we going after continuous certification? Um, I don't. I'm not sure. I think that yeah. we we have to we have to show we're doing the best job we can, and then respond to the challenges as they come up. Right. So, last question. So we already have robots in the OR, and it's not too far fetched to imagine a computer someday that can perform all the steps of an operation without human monitoring. So, do you ever see the board certifying robots? No, I see the board certifying people who um, who run the robots. So you're talking. You're talking about. You're talking. Somebody has got to design the operation the robot's doing. Okay. Put in the software. That, yeah. that particular person has to put the software into the robot. And so, what does a robot do? Well. You use it to take out a prostate, 
<laughs> That's and, right. And sure, you could use a robot to do a rhinoplasty. But you got to program that computer specifically for a rhinoplasty, which is, I think, a difficult process. So the board doesn't examine the robot. Examines the guy that's doing the compute, that's doing the software to, to tell you what to do. I can envision. I mean, if, if somebody comes into the office and wants a rhinoplasty, and you take a photograph and uh, and break and then write a piece of software to show how you want this bone cut and you want your osteotomies and what you want to do with the septum and what you want to do. You could. I mean, the technology yeah. is possibly there. Yeah. I mean, you just just use Notabiki and draw it, and, <laughs> and, and, and you could do that. But the, uh, somebody's got to do that. Some human has got to be there to do that. So there will always be a need for the board. I think there will always be a need for the board as long as there's a need for the specialty. Correct. And I think that's important. I think that I think that we need to obviously be leading the specialty, which we've always done since 1937, but adapting to redefining the specialty. Um, I think the I think the whole issue that the board's got has dealt with well in the past and has got to continue to deal with in the future is the issue of fragmentation versus subspecialization. Right. In other words, uh, uh, we, we the board traditionally has tried to avoid fragmentation while encouraging subspecialty development. And I think that's line, that's yeah. that's a that's a difficult thing to do, yeah. and we've done we've done well with that, but that's that's um, uh, as long as the specialty exists as a specialty, then I think the board's going to do fine. Thank you again for all. Thank you, time. Keith, and welcome aboard. <laughs>